I can't hear anyone. Uh, I'm Karen Modaleski. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to help bring you this Alex webinar on preservation practice and working with vendors. This week's free webinar is to celebrate the inaugural ALA and Elects Preservation Week, an initiative of partners that include the Library of Congress, where I'm working, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Society of American Archivists, and others. Elects is pleased to have three suppliers of archival products as corporate sponsors of Preservation Week, Gaylord Archival Products and FamilyArchives.com. Please visit their websites for more information about the products and services they can offer. Today's speaker is Peter Verheyen, Head of Preservation and Conservation at Syracuse University, where he established the Library Conservation Lab. Peter began as a work-study student at Johns Hopkins University under famed conservator John Dean, and he's never looked back. He studied binding and cons conservation in Germany and Switzerland, and he's worked with world-renowned binders and conservators. He became a rare book conservator working in private practice and research library preservation programs. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm a little... Uh, Am I changing the screen correctly? Peter is also a book artist who exhibits bindings in the U.S. and abroad. He began web publishing in the early 90s, so he's really a Renaissance man, and he now publishes The Bone Folder, an e-journal for book arts and book workers. Lest all of those credentials uh, intimidate you a little, and I have to, under I have to share that I'm a little intimidated by that, he's also a heck of a nice guy. As the program moves on, please use the question box to answer questions, ask questions. And although we have said that questions will be accepted throughout, uh, in fact, there are about 500 of you, and we just can't answer that number of questions as the program progresses. So we'll hold those questions, and we may be able to answer some questions at the end. And if we can't, we will... Uh, uh, aggregate questions and they will be sent to Peter who will answer questions and will uh, post a kind of FAQ sheet. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter. Okay, show my screen. Hello, um, my name is Peter Verheyen and thank you all for attending this webinar on Archival 101 and um, working with vendors. One thing I'd like to say at the outset is that this workshop was developed when I was working at Gaylord as archival product manager and it was developed for the call center staff and these are people who have absolutely no training in preservation conservation issues but at the same time they're also expected that, to answer a lot of archival product questions as users like all of us call the com call center. Uh, most, of these ants most of the things that I'm going to be bringing up are designed to be very commonsensical and pragmatic. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of hardcore chemistry or any of those things. Um, so let's begin and thank you all for attending. So what does archival mean? Um, for, for starters, it's very difficult to quantify and can mean different things for many um, different materials. It can also be referred to storing and treating an item with the most sound and appropriate materials in a proper environment, and it implies long-term storage. So when you're talking about archival for a book, it's not just the paper that makes up the book, it's the glue, but, and it's also the structure. So all those things combine, you know, are your documents, what kind of paper are, are they on, are they brittle? Um, what are you going to stick them into? So it's not that easy to quantify, and archival is really, in a lot of senses, a marketing term. What are the types of materials that we would be housing as we're dealing with buying supplies? They're manuscripts, so letters and documents and other paper-based materials, photographs, prints, maps, books, pamphlets, ephemera, everything from broadsides to announcements to pins and other little tchotchkes. They can be textiles, like quilts and clothing, any number of objects. 
And a different category from those are records which have generally, in the archival context, have a retention period and are discarded thereafter. Um, and so long-term storage for them may or may not be required. Um, tax documents you need to keep for something like seven years. I hope no one from the IRS is here, but you should be able to destroy them thereafter. So the long-term aspects may not be as appropriate. Um, what are some of the issues and problems of these materials? Well, number one among them is poor environment. Um, things that are too hot, too humid, they can lead to either desiccation of the items and accelerated aging, or if it's too humid, it can also be leading to mold and other problems. Um, poor storage materials storing things in shoe boxes, old PVC sleeves, whatever else one happened to have around. Handling is a major problem um, and is probably one of the leading contributors to damage among documents and other objects that we all collect. Um, disaster preparedness is something that one needs to be very aware of. Some of the objects that you have in your collection may well have experienced some kind of flood or other damage, such as fire. And then there's the quality of the artifacts themselves. They can be acidic and on very poor quality paper, brittle, torn, either because of the nature of the materials themselves or the handling. Fragility comes into play, and they can also be sensitive to a whole range of other factors, such as light. Um, so what solutions do we have? A major one is proper storage and for that what we're looking for are archival materials appropriate for those artifacts. That can include boxes, folders, binders, albums, enclosures, and other raw materials that you would use to create your own enclosures and storage environments. Um, the proper environment is equally important and contributes to the longevity of your collections. That can include things like UV filters on lights and windows, desiccants in environments that are confined and where you need to keep things much more stable. Using silica gels, for example, in a large room or collection is not going to be terribly effective, especially if doors open and close, but can be very effective in a confined exhibition space or case. Um, and then you'll want hydrothermographs, um, either the digital kind or the old paper-based kind, to monitor your environment and make sure that you're not having extremes of climate. In, um, you know, what you want is you want to try to keep it all as stable as possible for the long term. And then there's repair and conservation, and that's something that you should really only do if you have, you know, a certain level of training. Um, and that can include things, you know, you'll be dealing with things like adhesives, tape, paper, board, cloth, erasers, and any number of other tools. Um, there's a question coming up, what is a desiccant? A desiccant, it, they are generally a silica-based beads in containers that absorb moisture from the environment and then can be reconditioned by baking, driving out that moisture, and then you put it back into the case. One of the most common terms you will hear in all of this is acid-free. And what does acid-free mean? Essentially, when you're buying archival materials, all the paper and paperboard products will be acid-free or should be. Some will be buffered, which means that they're alkaline with a pH of around 8 or 9 percent with the alkaline reserve in there. Others will be non-buffered or unbuffered, and that means they'll be neutral in their pH or around 7. And the unbuffered becomes important, as I'll explain later on, for some classes of material. Um, another thing to remember is that when you buy something, the pH will be acid-free or alkaline at the time of manufacture. But as, those, as you place items into folders, into boxes, as those materials are exposed to the environment, that alkaline res reserve that's in the paperboard will be used up and they will slowly become acidic over time.
So what does that mean? Does that mean that you have to replace all your boxes and folders? No, not really, because the boxes are still protecting artifacts from light, dust, and handling as you're shipping them around your collections. And, you know, important thing to remember is that it really is not feasible to refold or rebox whole collections over time. If I were to think of our situation here at Syracuse, we'd be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars every couple of years just to refolder everything, never mind the staff. But what you do want to do is if you notice that um, folders are breaking down or getting tattered, um, the lids of document cases are starting to tear, is by all means replace those. If there are collections of very sensitive materials and you notice that there are problems with those materials, with you know, yellowing migrating into the materials from the folders, then yes, you would want to replace it. But you really have to be measured in that because otherwise you'll never be able to keep up with it and you'll drive yourself batty. So remember that those boxes, even if they are older, are no longer acidic, are still protecting the collections from other factors. So I mentioned buffered and unbuffered materials. What does that mean? Buffered materials are generally preferred for all materials except for some photographs, primarily color and the more sensitive kinds, and then textiles that are made out of protein-based materials. That would be silk and wool. And that's because that alkaline reserve can cause damage. You also want to be careful putting things like blueprints and sepia prints into buffered environments because that can cause those to fade. Um, you know, in terms of a life expectancy, that's really going to vary a lot and depends on what's in the materials. You just, it's something that you have to monitor. Um, buffered materials are going to be able to absorb those acids that are compounds that are in the air, in the dust, for longer periods of time than unbuffered materials, but they too will become acidic over time. That's just a given. But what they have is they have a higher pH to start out with, and then the calcium carbonate reserve, that's that CO, CaCO3 thing, of approximately 3%. Calcium carbon is basically like a chalk or um, ground up marble, and that absorbs acids and bonds it and neutralizes it. Acid-free means that it's neutral at the time of manufacture, but it's not going to have that buffering in it. So those materials would be appropriate for use with some of the um, protein-based textiles, photographs, blueprints, things like that. Okay. Lignin-free is another term that you're going to hear, and lignin is part of the plants that are used to make paper. And for most manufactured papers, especially machine maids that are made from, not from rag, that can be removed when the pulp is extracted chemically, but it's going to stay in papers like newsprint. So, you know, that, that's what's, re the lignin is largely what's responsible for the rapid and aging and yellowing of that newsprint. Um, the fact that it doesn't have any buffering in it as well helps accelerate that, but lignin is not something that you want to have in your papers. Um, Lignin-free materials are basically anything that you buy that's labeled as an archival paper product is going to be lignin-free. And when we're talking about those specific products, um, you know, any of the folders, um, the blue-gray boxes we all buy, the tan boxes, the corrugated boxes, um, and other raw materials. Those tan boxes are going to cost you more than the blue-gray boxes, and, you know, that's something to look at. Not every, the, the gray and the tan boxes are generally going to be interchangeable, and that's, you know, if cost is an object, that's going to be something to look at. However, Excuse me. If you require unbuffered boxes, you're really going to want to look for the tan boxes and specifically those that are labeled unbuffered. Okay. 
plastics. And there are, there's, we, we use a lot of plastics, especially when we're trying to rehouse things like photographs or encapsulate documents and other materials. And most of those that we get from our archival vendors nowadays are safe. And they, they're made in, um, generally in one of three materials. There's mylar, which is crystal clear. It's rigid, meaning it's kind of stiff and crinkly but it's an inert polyester film, and mylar is actually it's a trade name. Polypropylene is clear like mylar, but it's not as stiff. It's softer, and it, well, it's softer. And then there's finally, there's polyethylene, which is equally inert, and polypropylene is inert as well, but can be less clear, can have this kind of milky consistency and be a little bit crinklier. And all three of those are safe for using with photographs. In some cases, if you buy mylar on a roll or big mylar sheets from a vendor that's not necessarily specialized on archival products, you want to be careful because those films can have coatings on them either to um, re you know, make dust go away or so that they can be printed. And you've got to be careful with that because if they have those coatings, it can stick to the objects that you have inside and cause it to lift off. The materials that you really need to be careful of are um, PVCs and acetate, and those are bad. And you can see in the image below, oh, that's a PVC sleeve, and many of us will remember all the PVC slide and negative sheets that we bought years and years ago, or sheets to slip photos into. and. Um, those, as they off-gas, can give off hydrochloric acid from the polyvinyl chloride and cause serious damage. They also will get stiff and brittle and just basically break down. Um, if you're looking at products made specifically for photographs and related objects, most of those nowadays are going to be labeled as archival. Sometimes they'll even have acid-free on there, which isn't necessarily as relevant with plastics as it would be with paper-based products because of, there's no, the plastics don't absorb the water, but the PVC off-gassing can be a real problem. So you want to avoid those, but they're also, they've also become much, much less common. That said, you will probably find in many of your collections that there are PVC sleeves, and if you do find those, it is something that you will want to replace. Newspaper, as I mentioned earlier, is made from very poor quality groundwood paper and is acidic by nature and only gets worse over time. Um, when we think about our brittle book problem, you know, that's a groundwood and that exemplifies it beautifully. Um, I still remember the image of Peter Waters blowing at a book and having all the um, scraps of paper flying about his ears. It's very dramatic, but it does illustrate the problem well, and their collections are filled with these materials. If it's in good condition, and you definitely need to keep it, as in the case of something like newspaper clippings, um, you know, you might, it is something that you might want to deacidify um, and then store in buffered enclosures or sleeves. An alternative would be to photocopy it onto acid-free paper and um, use that instead. But I do know that in many cases the original clippings have some artifact, can have artifactual significance. So it's a decision that you have to make on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so anyway. As we work with materials, and this is something that you know, we encounter a lot in things like scrapbooks and elsewhere, we encounter in adhesives. And you know, even in our field, we will use adhesive products. And some of the more common ones that we'll encounter that have legacy issues are tapes and glue sticks. And people have used those over the years to adhere their materials into things such as scrapbooks and albums. Rubber cement factors in there as well. 
And those objects can be very difficult to remove, and the tape and the glue can also cause damage in the way of staining. Um, if you're looking at older solvent-based tapes, what you have is, you know, you can note, you'll see the yellowing. After a while, you'll see that the carrier of the tape flakes off, and you've got this big, ugly brown stain underneath, and that's a result of the cross-linking of the solvent-based adhesives in the paper below. And that's almost impossible to remove except with um, solvents, and it's not something that you want to try um, unless you have the proper facilities and the trained conservator because not only can you cause problems with the removal if there's other sensitive media, but you can do damage to yourself. Um, you know, if you have to use tape for things, use something like Filmoplast, which has an acrylic, acrylic adhesive. It's pH neutral. The paper carrier is buffered. And that won't cause damage, but again, once you stick it on, the tape is the is going to become more aggressive over time and sit tighter. So pretty much once it's on, it's on for good. And you know that's something that you have to remember. Even though the adhesive may be water soluble, the material that you stuck it to may have other issues which will become even bigger if whatever, you know, the markers, the inks, the pigments start to bleed when you put it in water, so it's not something that you want to do. So basically, consider any of these tapes permanent once you stick them on, unless you have trained conservators who can work on those. Instead of tapes, you can also use things like archival photo corners or strips. Um, those are generally made out of inert materials that won't react with the photographs or the other objects that you might stick in, and they allow the materials to be removed easily, so you're not permanently adhering them. And they're not just for photographs. You can use them with drawings. You can use them with cards, if that's the kind of ephemera that you're putting into a scrapbook. Pretty much anything that you can slip into it, you can hold with it. And it's, it's a non-permanent bond, and it's fairly safe. Um, the only thing you might need to worry about is if the material flexes, the harder edges of those corners or strips may cut your, into your material. But if it's not something that's expected to flex and you're handling it carefully, it's better than the alternative of using tape or other materials that will permanently stick it down. Um, how long will these materials last? when we put them into archival enclosures. That's something that's really going to depend and is based on any number of variables. You have the initial chemistry of the artifacts. If an object is very unstable, it's still going to deteriorate, although it may be at a slower rate in the archival enclosure, but it's still going to break down, and we can't really stop that. Temperature and humidity can accelerate those that aging process. Um, you know, think about the things that you find in grandma or grandpa's attic or in the dank basement. Um, they all cause problems and you, you want to minimize exposure to those conditions. Um, usage can also make a big difference. We like to fixate on environmental damage, but I would venture to say that more damage in the long term is caused by handling the materials, especially once they start to age and become brittle. Um, using gloves on you know, very brittle paper, it's very easy to catch an edge, and the next thing you know, you've torn it. So it might be better to use clean hands or you know, any number of other factors. Um, most archival paper materials are designed to last 500 years or more under optimal conditions, but again, that's a really variable thing. So if you take that acid-free archival buffered material and you put it in the attic, it's going to age just as other material will, but because the initial quality is better, it's just going to take a little bit longer to do that. Um, plastics, um, if they're you know, chemically inert and stable, they can last almost forever. So, you know, it's still something that you want to think about. 
One of the things that you will see in catalogs mentioned a lot is the PAT, the photo activity test, and that's something that vendors pay the Image Permanence Institute at the University, well, Rochester Institute of Technology, a lot of money to test for, and it's basically, it's performed on most of the materials or types of materials that they will sell, so paper, boards, plastics, um, and what it does specifically is indicates that a material is safe for use with photographs. But if something is safe for photographs, which by and large are more sensitive than regular paper, in quotes, then you know it's going to be sense, it's going to be good for those as well, and that 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 items past that test is something that's going to be indicated in the catalog or should be. Most vendors that sell the materials that all of us buy, the paper, the board, the plastics, all those materials by and large have passed that test, even if it's not necessarily indicated on an item level. You know, look at the boxes. If it's you know if it's gray white boxes. If it says past, if you see other gray white boxes in the same catalog and it doesn't say that, they're all going to be made from the same material. So you can make those kind of assumptions. One of the questions that gets asked a lot is why are these archival materials so expensive? And a really big one is the cost of the raw materials. Archival quality materials, by and large, especially the specifications that places like National Archives and Library of Congress have determined, cost more to produce because the ingredients that make up those products are of a higher, pure grade. Um, there's also the fact that market forces and perception play a real role. And these, the materials that we buy are made for a select group. The, you know, in the greater scheme of things, the archival product market is a very, very, very small part of the overall paper market. So if a mill is going to make something just for one of the vendors, it's going to be a much smaller run in terms of the batch size, and they're going to charge accordingly. Um, costs can go down as these products become more of a commodity and less of a specialty product. One of the things that we've also seen over the years is that even basic copier papers that we will buy at a place like Staples or Kinko's are buffered now because of the way papers manufactured has changed. There, it's more of an alkaline process than it used to be. So, you know, one of the things that you can do is get yourself an Abbey pH pen, and when you go to the office supply store, is just test it, you know, open up one of the papers that you may be interested in, don't let anybody catch you, but just run it down the end and see if it turns purple or not. If it's purple, it's good. Okay. You know, these products have, as they become more of a commodity, they also become more undifferentiated. And there are only so many manufacturers out there, and most of these vendors will be buying their paperboard products and their plastics from the same vendors. So, you know, it's going to have the same raw stock made with the same equipment. It's all geared towards the same standards. And the quality is going to be relatively uniform, although some vendors are better at some things than others, but most of that comes down more towards a manufacturing standpoint. One of the key differences you'll see, though, is that there may be some visual or tactile differences between some of the boards. Some of the more expensive paperboard boxes and folders may have a very nice, smooth, shiny finish. And I'm not necessarily talking about the ones that have coatings on them to make them waterproof. And others may be a little bit rougher. At the end of the day, they all meet the same chemical specifications. And if cost is an issue, by all means, use that as an indicator. Um, and what you really want to do and should do is to shop around, request catalogs from others, and compare. Um, you know, we all, it's our responsibility to be educated consumers of these products. Um, one of the things that you will find is that the, arc, the catalogs from these archival product vendors contain a wealth of information and when these slides go up online, you know, hopefully some of these links will become clickable, but for example, the Gaylord T 
tips and guides were written by Nancy Schrock, um, largely when she was worked as a consultant for them, and were pr produced as the Pathfinders, which have been distributed very widely. University Products, Hollinger, Metal Edge, Creative Memories, all these vendors have technical information. And even though there may be some marketing language built into those, the information that they provide is valuable and valid information. So, you know, it's if you're not really sure, that can help you. And you know, you can still, you'll still want to check if you're unsure about something. But it is information that you can trust by and large. But do keep in mind that they are trying to sell you products as well. Excuse me. As we start to use these materials, one of the things that we want to do is be creative and flexible. You know, we all look at the catalogs, we see the pictures that are in there depicting how these products can be used. But just because a box is made for one thing doesn't mean it can't be used for another. You can use things like slide and photo pages to store ephemera in, such as buttons, um, silk bookmarks, paper bookmarks, what have you. You can put clippings in photo pages rather than adhering them to album pages. And if you're you know, looking for permanent papers, the North Guide to North American Permanent Papers is still fairly valuable even though it's dated, but that again, go check those materials as you're buying them if you have that option. Um, you know, one of the products that I enjoyed um, cursing the most are the glue and binders that were developed many, many, many years ago and even in special collections are used to house what are now valuable pamphlets and other materials. And those, the hard edge of the cloth, will cause a real problem with the brittle paper because it makes, as you try to turn that page, it's a hard edge, the material will break. But those binders aren't necessarily bad. It's, you know, it's the way that they were applied. So one of the things that you could do is fold a, a piece of good paper around the object that you want to stick into the binder and then sew it through that or into the paper and then glue that into the binder. So that way the adhesive from that sew-in binder isn't necessarily attached to your document or your artif other artifact. Um, you can make your own envelope binders by um, sticking in archival envelopes in using that glue and binder, using the adhesive that's already there, or you can use something like double-sided tape to put them in. So combining products to make the sizes and the style of thing that you need. If you only ha need limited quantities of certain types of materials, sometimes it can be more efficient to buy standard things and then cut them down and modify to fit than it would be to buy lots of very specialized materials that you may not use as often. Um, you can also make things like your own envelope slings by just folding a piece of paper around the brittle materials and then inserting that into the envelopes or other enclosures like the um, photo sleeves. As you're buying materials, one of the things that you want to do, definitely do, is compare your pricing. And you definitely want to pay attention to the quantity price breaks that the vendors offer. Look at your sales flyers. Um, most of the archival product manufacturers are going to offer promotions at various times throughout the year. And those can be really, you know, time well spent to look at. Um, and you also, especially if you're going to buy larger quantities of materials, request bid pricing rather than ordering straight from the catalog. Yes, you, that may, well, or that will require larger quantities of materials. But maybe you can combine orders with other organizations or even you know other units within your institution, and you know also check with your purchasing department wherever you happen to be because they might get contract or bid pricing, and you don't even know about it. You know, and if you also if you have specific questions about the products, call their customer service people. You know, if you've got pricing questions, call the customer service bid department or your sales rep. And if you're not sure about how to use something, you know, talk to your regional preservation colleagues or con 
contact some of the consortia like Northeast Document, um, Conservation Center for Art and Historical Artifacts, or Lyricis, um, because they have people on staff that can help you answer many of the questions that you may have. And you know, read the catalogs. They, you know, the tech tips are very valuable, and they'll show you how to use things. They'll indicate what types of materials are suitable for what kinds of artifacts. And the thing to remember is, even though the language may be, you know, marketing speak to a degree, most of those tech tips were written by preservation professionals, and so there's a certain credibility I think that comes with that, even though they are in an archival product catalog. In terms of custom orders, that's something that's getting easier and easier, and most vendors will be more than happy to make custom sizes or custom runs, um, you know, especially if they're larger quantities. And that can be anything from binders to folders to enclosures. Um, boxes are a little bit more complicated, but even that's easier. Um, when I worked at Gaylord, that was in 19, I started there in 1999, I was there for a year, actually it was 98. Um, you know, box making was, on a production basis, was made with dies, and that image on the left there shows basically a big die cutting machine. You put the die on and it cuts out the box and puts creases where you need to make the folds and then the edging would be put on. A die like that could cost four or five hundred dollars back then and would be limited for one box. Nowadays all we have to do is put measurements into a machine such as the one on the right and it can make one box for us fairly quickly. And those those new cutting machines have incredible versatility and have made it very, very easy for vendors to make custom boxes in just about any size. And that way you can get a perfect fit or a better fit for what it is that you're trying to do. Um, another reality is that custom orders of custom orders is that many items in the catalog are made to order because the sales volume overall is fairly low. They'll sell a lot of boxes or a lot of folders, but they make them up as they need them. It's kind of just in time thing. So if you do need a special size, ask for it. There may be minimums, but they can do it. You know, if something is made, let's say, in a gray blue-gray or gray-white board, and you'd rather have it made in the E-flute corrugated or something, that's very easy to do because they can use that same material in the same die or the cutting and then put it together. Um, so you'll see those substitution options in most of the catalogs now. Um, metal edge designs are great. It is what is still specified, but when you order those, you're paying to ship an awful lot of air. And so you might want to look at the ship flat boxes that you have to assemble yourself. And then the corrugated that's used for those ship flat boxes is, you know, there's a bonus to using that in that it's less expensive than the other board materials. So, you know, that's, that's something that you want to look at and, you know, compare. See what kinds of options the various vendors give you. Um, you know, to find more information about the issues surrounding the artifacts that we house, the chemistry of the materials and things like that, I think the most authoritative um, place to go and ask questions, especially in the interactive mode, is Conservation Online, which is now hosted by the American Institute of Conservation. Walter Henry started that back in the late 80s. And it's still the same resource that it's always been, which is pretty much the best. Um, others, like Northeast Document Conservation Center, will have a lot of how-tos and tip files on their site that you can download that will deal with issues such as environment, housing materials, um, working with vendors to a degree, and those can be very valuable. And then I've also, more locally, um, but I've also included links to a lot of other resources from our pages here at Syracuse. And so what I'd like to do is thank you all for attending this webinar and, you know, to consider registering for others in this series. And 
I'm op you know, we can open it up for questions at this point. I'll try to answer them as best I can. I will be down getting a copy of the log file and anything I can't answer in the time that we have left, I will type up and post somewhere so that all of you can see that. So if there are any questions, I'd love to hear them now. And thank you very much. Hello? Okay, I'm seeing a whole bunch of them here. Um, it, M Melanex is the same material as Mylar. I believe Mylar was a DuPont trade name. Melanix was an ICI. They are all polyester, which is inert. Um, how can you tell if an older sleeve is PVC? Um, if it's older and it's deteriorated, that's fairly simple. You'll see that it's starting to get cloudier. Um, it's starting to warp, get you know, uneven. There's a lot of visual clues. Um, acetate is a little bit different. It, it'll look a lot like mylar in that it's a clear film, but acetate will also become brittle over time. So if you think about the simple binder type things that we used to for our reports when we were in school or something, that's an acetate. And those are, are, will get brittle over time. Um, so those are good visual clues um, and tactile ones. Um, in terms of deacidifying newsprint, um, there are products out there such as Wayto and Bookkeeper. Um, Wayto, last I checked, is a solvent-based product. Um, it comes in aerosol cans. Bookkeeper um, comes, and there's other equivalent um, trade names that don't I don't have you know memorized right now, but those will very often come in like a pump bottle. They're they're the ones that will be advertised as being um, non-toxic and things like that. I would use those simply because they're a little bit safer to use for you as well. But the thing to remember is that if you're deacidifying newsprint, that can and will darken the newsprint depending on its condition. So it's kind of a toss-up. In terms of deacidifying them, how do you do it? Um, you can spray them. Um, if you have a conservation lab and you, you can mix up your own deacidification solutions, you can do that aqueously by washing and deacidifying. Um, or some of the solutions also come brush-on or dippable. The thing to remember is that if you deacidify a newspaper, you know, it's not going to make it any less brittle um, than it was before. Washing the item first can help with that, but again, that's not something that you're going to be doing unless you're a conservator. Um, and mixing up the soda water with the milk of magnesia, I think, is at this stage, is a little passe. Um, would I ex encapsulate acidic items that haven't been deacidified? Um, yes, but you know the, again, it depends a lot on how they're going to be used. If we have visual items or newspapers or something like that that get an awful lot of use, and sometimes you can't, you know, deacidification isn't necessarily an option. Like let's say blueprints, I will encapsulate them, and that will at least allow them to be handled and will reduce the mechanical damage that they'll be exposed to. At the same time, if you're not sure about something, you can also put a piece of acid-free, either buffered or unbuffered paper behind those items before you, when you slip them into mylar, so a more passive deacidification, if you will, because the acids and other degradation products that are in the artifact will migrate into that better paper. Um, let's see. Okay, 
lots and lots of questions here. Um, The photo activity test, how, do, how is that done? Um, that is something that you have to send out for to the Image Permanence Institute and what they will do is basically artificially age the materials that you're sending in for testing and there's a few other things but it is a test that they do. Um, the pH testing pen that you could use to test your papers to make sure it, it's not going to tell you if it's buffered or not. It's going to tell you if it's acid-free. Um, and that will be indicated by the purple. If it's yellow, then that paper is already acidic. Um, but at least it gives you a clue. And that's the, uh, that's the Abby pen. Um, the purple is not necessarily going to go away. Um, the microchamber products, I really, I don't have a lot of experience with. I do know that they are quite expensive, and I think, you know, thinking pragmatically, it's something that you have to, you know, you have to weigh all your options. What is the object that you're putting into it, and how many of them are there, and how much money do you have? Um, you know, a lot of this, a lot of what, you know, the the hard facts, you know, deal with a perfect world, and what we work in is a very imperfect environment where we have to weigh all those different competing standpoints. Um, glue and binder, wow, okay. Um, what is it? Those were the old binders that had a piece of gummed fabric on the inside. You dampened it with a sponge, and then you stuck your stuff, your artifact into it, and they stuck to it. Um, they should, I think, I believe they're still being made, and especially for cheaper ones. Um, how do I decide between storing documents in flat boxes or document cases? I think that will depend a lot on is the item going to sag um, and curl. If I have a document case and I only have a few things in there, I can bulk it up from behind, but if it's something that's, you know, very limp, it's still going to sag in that folder, in that case, so I will want to store that flat. Um, you know, that kind of scenario. If you have a storage container that's already being used, is it buffered or unbuffered? You could do a surface pH test um, by getting some pH strips, and that would require putting a drop of water on the object, letting it sit for a little bit, and then putting it in. Um, that's really the best way to do that. I know I've encountered boxes here at Syracuse where they were, some of them were completely acidic inside and out. Those are some of our oldest ones. Then we have some that are where the liners on the exterior and interior are still buffered, but the core, which is a cheaper paperboard product, is um, acidic. And then there are some that are still buffered, but that's something that you have to test aqueously with pH strips or with digital pH meters. Um, photocopy paper made from recycled materials can be acidic, I mean can be, sorry, can be archival, but that's going to depend a lot on how that paper is manufactured and if they add buffering to it. Recycled paper, the fibers are shorter though because that paper's had been repulped. So it may not have as much fold strength over um, newer paper, new papers made from virgin materials. Um, the photo activity test supposedly does apply to pretty much all photographic materials. Um, Abby pH pens, check your catalogs. I believe Gaylord sells them, University Products, um, Archival Products, all those vendors, last time I checked, should have them. Um, Talus may also have them. Um, in terms of housing textiles, rolling materials versus boxing, I would say it depends on the size of the material and whether it can be folded based on condition and other factors. Really, a lot of these things are 
case by case. Um, mat board, is, is that buffered or unbuffered? Again, it depends. A lot of the better quality mat boards are going to be rag as opposed to wood pulp. Um, and that's something that you would really need to find out from the vendor specifically. I don't really have that information. Um, in terms of labeling photographs, um, can I put a piece of filmoplast on it and, and to label it? Uh, that's something, that's a question that I encountered frequently when I was working at Gaylord. I also got to do the helpline, especially it was an instance where people would you know, say they put archival stickers on photographs and were trying to get them off and it caused damage. I wouldn't stick any self-adhesive product onto a photograph. Um, if I was going to do it, I might use something, if it was going to be a permanently labeled, I might use something like the IdentiPen if a pencil didn't work. Um, but again, that's something that I would be very cautious about doing. Um, the scanning damage paper. Um, that's going to be, I, I believe the question was, is prompted by light damage. I think the light damage, you know, the exposure that the paper is going to get, even though that light is very bright, it's a very short-term exposure. I think the greater damage or the greater potential for damage is going to be the handling and taking the paper out of the folder, putting it on the scanner, and then putting it back. Um, so, you know, you want to be careful. I would not be too concerned about scanning things, um, especially if it's not being rescanned. So if you scan something once, make sure you have it set up so that you can find those images again in case someone requests it so it's only a one-time deal. Mylar rolls come in a great many lengths. Look at your archival vendors. Um, you know, they'll sell it by rolls, by sheets, and in some cases you may also want to contact specialty vendors for film products like that. We had a question about lantern slides, glass slides, negatives, things like that. The best way to store those is I would put them into either paper four flap enclosures or into individual folders and then box them out of light, which is going to cause a lot of aging, and um, you know, you want to make sure that the glass, especially if they're glass plates, that they don't get, you know, exposed to shocks, which can cause them to crack. <coughs> um, our magazine clippings, as a Cidic as newspaper, and require the same preservation measures. Um, Again, it depends. They're not necessarily made of ground wood, but glossy papers have a lot of fillers in them, mostly um, things like um, chalk, which are buffered, but there's not a lot of fiber. So there's trade-offs in both directions. I would treat them the same as newsprint, and that will just help them last longer. Um, in terms of processing collections, there's a lot of literature that's come out on that recently. That is not really my area of expertise, but um, I would check with the Society of American Archivists and um, in their bookstore. There's a lot of um, books for different levels of processing. Um, home storage inside a wooden cabinet. I would not do that because the wood has lots of tannins in it, and if you've ever unframed a print or other objects that had that's had wood backing. You can often see the texture of the wood, the grains, and those are the tannins migrating into that paper. Um, and so I wouldn't use wood for anything. Um, in terms of obtaining copies of the slides, they'll be available via Alex um, from the website here where the presentation will be repeated. But um, I'll also have it online at Sir via the a link from my site at Syracuse, just for the slides, not the audio. Um, in terms of making um, in-house photo sleeves for oversized things, you can either go the old standby of 
double-sided tape such as a 3M415, but remember to leave lots of room, you know, that meaning about, you know, like a, at least a quarter of an inch or a little bit more between the tape and the object all around and making sure that it doesn't shift or getting something like an inexpensive edge sealer and you can weld the mylar with that. Um, not everybody can afford an ultrasonic welder, although I still covet one and miss not having one anymore. Um, yes, you can um, insert buffered paper. I wouldn't use tissue simply because as you turn the pages, the tissue isn't as dimensionally stable, but use a buffered paper between pages in a scrapbook, especially if that paper is brittle. But remember, anything that you add is going to add a lot of bulk to it. So you might not be able to, but you know, with the, the wide range of materials inside scrapbooks, everything from color photographs, to watercolors, to printed materials, to newspaper clippings. You also don't want to just go ahead and deacidify that. Um, in terms of types of objects, a list of types of objects that can be put in buffered and unbuffered, um, I believe that there are fairly comprehensive lists out there, but I will look into it. Um, Lamination um, and acid-free, interesting question. Lamination, that's a very permanent thing. So, and having seen objects and had to work on objects when I worked as a conservator that had been laminated, once you do that, that is not reversible unless you're using very heavy-duty solvents. What I would do instead is encapsulate. So put it in mylar and seal, make sure all four edges are sealed or just you know, seal it on th two or three so that you can take the materials in and out. Um, should maps be stored flat or rolled? That really depends, um, but if you store things rolled, what you want to do is do more of a tube in a tube where you're rolling the material around the exterior of the small diameter tube and then putting um, like a piece of mylar or a good quality paper over the, on the exterior of that small roll tube with everything in it and then sliding that into a bigger tube. Um, that way you don't have to force it in and it's much easier to get the materials in and out which is one of the best ways to damage it. Um, upright or flat for glass plate negatives. Um, we have a lot of glass plate negatives here at Syracuse. We are storing them upright in small document cases all individually folded and um, make sure that the boxes are the, um, the narrower ones so that they're not too heavy so that the average person can carry them and make sure we don't drop them. If you store them flat, you get into the weight issues and can cause things to stick to each other much more so than if they're vertical. Um, and then newspaper clippings in a viewer-friendly way, um, you know, that you can put them into uh, Mylar page protectors or, you know, photo sheets something like that. I mean, that, that really allows you, and then put them into boxes to store. Um, I think we've pretty much gone actually through most of the questions, and I see that our time is almost up, and if there's nothing else that's come through, um, there's one more here. It's a way for hanging folders to be hung in boxes. That's something that may work in the bigger record storage cartons, which are sized for hanging folders but you'll find that the tabs stick out beyond the, um, you know, the height of the box, so the lid isn't going to close all the way, plus the quality of the paper in the hanging file bit is not necessarily going to be archival, um, so that may not work as well. And I do not know about self-sealing mylar sleeves. It's, that's something that I'm fairly unfamiliar with at this stage. So I guess this wraps it up. Thank you all very much, and I will now turn it over to my hosts.
thank you, everybody. Peter, you provided practical information not only about what we shouldn't do or often can't do, but what we can do to protect our collections. I thought it was a terrific presentation. To our participants, thank you for being with us. Later this afternoon, you're going to receive a short online evaluation form, and we hope you'll take a few minutes to fill it out and return it. Your comments really do help the Elects Continuing Education Committee plan for future offerings not only on the topic of preservation, but also on other topics. I'd like to thank the HF group, which is a, a provider of binding and binding materials, once more for supporting the free ELECTS webinars for Preservation Week. It was a very generous contribution. As we set, sign off, I'd also like to thank Plan Bleu of the Continuing Education Committee and Julie Reese of ELECTS for organizing this webinar, and Charles Wilt, Alex Executive Director for uh, Recording, and Carrie Cassio for very able technical support. We hope that you'll take the opportunity to join us again on May 13th for Michelle Brown's free webinar on mold prevention and remediation, something that we all have occasion to come up against. And you have, in addition, a wonderful opportunity to hear the first of three webinars on the important topic of emergency preparedness. This one's by Nancy Kraft of the University of Iowa. And while it's not free, it's a heck of a bargain for listening to Nancy. She has had experience with the Iowa floods of 1993 and 2008, with a local courthouse fire, with, uh, with flooding in the basement of the uh, uh, state archives. She is a highly experienced disaster responder from the University of Iowa Libraries, where she's head of preservation. Thank you once again. We hope you'll join us again. And it's been a lot of fun for us. <laughs>